the big problems in the whole area of physician health is it tends to be an assumption that physicians can somehow resilience themselves out of the problems. Um, and that if physicians only you know, have a better work-life balance and look after each other better, that somehow they'll be able to cope better. Um, and that is just simply not true. Um, the, the literature shows very clearly that uh, you know, the major factor causing the large amounts of burnout that are around at the present time, and, and you know, studies vary, but somewhere between 40 and 50% of physicians at some stage during their lives have substantial symptoms of burnout. <laughs> editor-in-chief for the books portfolio of the American Psychiatric Association, and welcome to the APA Books Podcast. Today we are discussing potential pathways that lead physicians to the act of suicide. Dr. Peter Yellowlease's new book, Physician Suicide, Cases and Commentaries, depicts ways to reduce the impact of related disorders of burnout, anxiety, depression, and addiction, as well as the influence of gender, aging, culture, and personal resilience related to suicide in physicians. It's my privilege to talk with you today, Peter, and I'm so grateful that you took on this very, very hard subject of physician suicide. Um, I think all of us have been touched by the experience of physician suicide and care so much about our colleagues. Um, what brought you to developing this particular book? So I guess it's just been, it's been a long um, process, basically. I mean, I've been seeing physicians throughout my whole career. Uh, both in Australia and then for the last nearly 20 years now in America, um, and have always uh, enjoyed seeing physicians as patients, um, and have had you know an interest in sort of medical boards and the regulation side of medicine. Uh, so, but, but what has really struck me from the whole literature is that there are very few uh, really sort of good visual descriptions of physicians as they become unwell. And, and the sort of almost life of physicians, you know, what stresses and pressures are there on uh, physicians throughout their whole careers and before they go to medical school. Um, so I teach uh, in our medical course here, our own medical students uh, about therapy. And I actually use the life of a physician as an example of a patient and, and work through the various different uh, dynamic issues that occur to all of us during our lives, both professionally and personally. Um, so for instance, I make a, a big deal about delayed gratification. Um, as we all know as physicians, delayed gratification is a huge deal. Uh, people often decide to go to medical school when they're 10, 11, 12 years old. And from literally that time on, they are not doing things uh, that their colleagues and friends are doing because they're trying to buff up their CV and do things that are relevant to get themselves into medical school eventually. And that whole process of delayed gratification goes on throughout our lives. So that we see it uh, you know, with uh, uh, residents, for instance, who have large debt and who can't buy a house at the same time as some of their friends, uh, or female residents who maybe don't want to have uh, children because of work and have to delay that. Uh, right through to retirement, where we commonly see, commonly see physicians who don't want to retire because, you know, they're still working. They, the whole sort of persona of being a physician has become very important to them. Um, and again, they, they sort of miss out on other things in life in some respect. Um, and, and this has been something that my patients have told me for years. It's been a, it's, it's a big issue. And I think, uh, so, so really the, the aim of this book was, you know, at a, at a fairly basic level was really just to try and you know, give pictures of physicians uh, at different times in their lives um, af affected by different uh, elements of the outside world. I think the book is beautifully organized with your 10 chapters organized around 10 stories, and the stories are poignant and hard. That's correct. And I mean, and I think the stories are all, first of all, they're all fictional. Um, but having said that, they're all based on reality. Um, so they describe, you know, events and situations that I've either come across or heard about from other colleagues or read about. Um, so I've tried to make them as realistic as possible. And as you correctly say, I've tried to you know, develop a whole series of different types of uh, scenarios, um, you know, literally from a, a sort of resident discussing his future career with his father and both of them whom are physicians and looking at the, the difference 
uh, for two generations, um, through to um, you know a physician from uh, you know an Italian background who has ultimately killed himself, and 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 the lead up to how that happened. So so I've tried to write these scenarios. Uh, in a way that really then allows me to describe some key clinical issues that relate to them. Thank you. Um, I think chapter seven, where you craft um, a suicide letter of an aging physician who has learned a couple of years earlier that he had cognitive, some kind of neurocognitive condition that was leading to diminished capacity to perform as a physician and his own denial and his own suffering through that and then his ultimate decision to commit suicide in the hope that this letter will then help other physicians or help the institutions where they work to address these really tragic situations. Boy, that story was a very painful one to read, and yet it had such truth to it. Can you tell me just a little bit more about that particular scenario? Yes, I mean, I think that is, uh, I mean, it's one of the more dramatic scenarios. Um, um, but it's interesting to actually have to write a suicide letter um, as an author um, and to really try and get inside the person's head. And I've seen patients who've been like this and who, where this has happened. And there's actually quite a big literature on how um, senior physicians um, you know, can in fact look like they're practicing well, but then when they have a, a single day when two or three, two or three things happen at once, uh, they can't cope. Uh, which is exactly what happened in this situation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was interesting to write the suicide letter and actually to, to then I started Googling, you know, how to suicide and, um, and, and looking around the internet for, um, you know, how would I as an intelligent person try and work out what sort of method I might choose. Um, and so I put a lot of these sorts of issues actually into the scenario. And I, I think, I hope it comes out effectively. It's a very tragic and sad end in reality for a, a obviously a fairly eminent physician who's had an excellent career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was really a beautifully written chapter as they all are. Um, when you think about what you were hoping for in developing this book, what impact you would have, what, what did you, what did you aspire to with this book? You know, my, I really aspired to getting the stories of physicians out there. I, I've been very heavily, heavily influenced personally, in fact, by both uh, Aboriginal and uh, Native American culture and have for many years treated patients from both of those areas. Um, and for them in particular, stories are really important. Um, and the, the literature on physician health tends to be a bit academic it tends not to have large numbers of stories in it for obvious reasons. People don't want to report what actually happens for confidentiality reasons. So I decided I'd try and write a book that really had some interesting stories, that, but, but stories that were realistic, really to fill that mm -hmm. hole. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a, a distressing but amazing study that was done with surgeons just a few years ago. Thousands of surgeons participated in this study and a significant barrier to seeking mental health care, despite feeling suicidal, um, was fear of being reported or reporting to uh, licensure organizations, professional organizations about the mental health issues they were struggling with. What, what can we do to try and dismantle either the stigma or these barriers to care for physicians? Yeah, I think there's two levels of stigma, as you correctly say, Laura. There's the stigma of seeing a psychiatrist. Um, and we know there's a big literature on how stigmatized psychiatrists are by other disciplines. Um, and, and so that's a common problem. And then there's the extra stigma related to, you know, I've sort of failed as a physician because I've somehow become ill. Um, if in fact the people accept that they're even ill. Um, and their fear of obviously some sort of regulatory response. And that fear is realistic. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, you know, and, and so one of the things that I always talk to, to physician patients about is, you know, in what situation might I ever have to report them? Um, and uh, one of the interesting misunderstandings that quite a few physicians have is about the role of medical boards in all of this. Um, they, they don't fully understand that, you know, the reason that this fear is there in reality is because the primary role of medical boards um, is to protect the patient. Um, and so whilst we pay our dues to the medical boards, really their, their main role is as a consumer-focused agency 
Um, and they're not here specifically to protect us as physicians. And so it's very important to try and treat physicians early before they become impaired. And, and I, that's a, a sort of mantra that I have with, with all of the patients. And it's something at UC Davis we work very hard on. We try and you know, essentially screen and see any physicians who might be becoming depressed or addicted in the early stages of their illness so that they're not uh, in any way clinically impaired. And as a result, you know, we don't have to report them to the medical board because uh, clearly it's, uh, that can then become a really difficult situation for them. What advice do you have for young physicians entering psychiatry about the kinds of issues they're going to face throughout their careers and in serving their colleagues throughout medicine? Well, I think the first thing is um, don't, uh, don't use denial. Um, unfortunately, we all do that. Um, you know, we all believe that uh, we, we're somehow going to manage ourselves. And the reality is, as physicians, we're not that special in that we have the same rates of psychiatric disorder and, and, and addiction uh, as, uh, you know, intelligent, similar people in the community, uh, with the exception that, in fact, potentially female physicians uh, actually may have slightly higher rates, um, particularly in, in, uh, of, of, of suicide specifically. Um, and so, so don't use denial. Um, look after yourself. Uh, I think there's no doubt about that. So, you, you know, you need to think about resilience. We should be teaching resilience in medical schools from day one. Um, uh, think about your organization. And if you're sort of angry or distressed in, about your organization, you need to try and do something to change it. Don't withdraw and avoid the problem. Um, it's a much, a much better approach is to get involved and try and, and change things. Um, and then finally, I think, think about your colleagues. Um, if you can learn to, um, you know, to approach your colleagues, if you think that they're distressed, then hopefully they will also approach you if you're distressed or unwell. Um, so, you know, I think this, the, the, the young generation that we're sort of teaching now are actually much better than the generation that we come from. Um, and uh, they're much more interested in work-life balance. Um, and uh, they're much less interested in, you know, the sort of uh, Saturday evening uh, tutorial. Um, and, um, and I think that's actually healthy. And I think they've got a lot that we can learn from them. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a matter of trying to uh, really understand the important positive aspects of being a professional, uh, because there are very many positive aspects to that culture of medicine that is heavily professionalized. Um, and making sure you don't fall, that fall into the unintended consequences, which can be you know, overwork, you know, doing the EMR on a Sunday evening, um, and um, <laughs> you know, basically not looking after yourself, not, not going to the gym, not sort of enjoying your social activities. And what advice would you have, again, for your fellow psychiatrists and maybe psychologists who have a patient who's committed suicide, perhaps a physician, but someone where objectively it looks like they have so many things going for them and where it is particularly puzzling or hard to accept uh, the loss of this patient? I think that's a really good question because, you know, and, I mean, the statistics are that, you know, every psychiatrist has at least one patient during their career uh, that they know very well who suicides. This is not just sort of any old patient. This is someone they've really got to know well. Um, so, so it's going to happen to most of us. And certainly if you treat physicians, it's likely to happen to you. And I've, I've had two physicians who've killed themselves uh, in my career. Um, and, and I think you need to think very carefully about the, the actual grief process itself. Um, uh, you know, I know in, in one of the scenarios in, in the book, uh, I actually have the scenario based uh, actually at the church uh, in the, uh, during the funeral of a, of a patient, of a, a physician. Uh, who's been treating that, that patient. And, uh, you know, I think that's part of actually the healing process. Now, not everybody goes to their patient's funerals, of course. Um, but, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't if, in fact, that, that feels like it would be a good thing to do. Um, but, but I think, you know, it's important, again, not to deny that this is an important issue. It's a sentinel event, essentially. I mean, the death of a, of a patient, particularly by suicide, is the equivalent of the loss of a patient uh, on the operating table for a surgeon. Uh, for us as psychiatrists. And I think we should treat it as a sentinel event and we should, you know, discuss it with our colleagues. We should potentially review what our uh, approach to that patient was. Was there anything else we could have done better or not? And, and, and again, take that in an educational way. 
Um, and, and that certainly does happen in many health systems. And, and I think it's certainly something we should encourage. You're listening to Psychiatry Unbound, APA Publishing's books podcast. We'll be back in a minute. We had some statistics that maybe um, would be good to emphasize. So you talked about how um, every psychiatrist may take care of one or two physician patients who may commit suicide. Um, Do you want to just make a few statements here about how an estimated 300 to 400 physicians die by suicide in the U.S. per year? That's probably an underestimate, Um, um, and particularly among uh, more elderly physicians, um, where there are probably more suicides than we think but where they're not marked down as suicides for social reasons uh, by, by their colleagues. Um, the, I guess another very important uh, statistic is that uh, you know, female physicians um, kill themselves 2.4 times more commonly than uh, equivalent uh, age-matched physicians in the community, um, and male physicians kill themselves about 1.4 times more commonly. And that's primarily because physicians are, um, are are knowledgeable, and so when they decide to kill themselves, they tend to be successful. But females, because females in the general population kill themselves less frequently than males, female physicians kill themselves significantly more commonly than than the general population. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I understand. <laughs> So maybe a little bit about how we're increasingly aware of the prevalence of mental health issues in medical students and residents and how that may kind of lay down the path for future mental health issues. So so we know that um, between 10 and 15 percent of physicians um, have some form of uh, of alcohol or substance abuse during their careers. Uh, We know that um, the majority of physicians still uh, have alcohol as their drug of choice. Um, but that uh, increasing numbers of physicians uh, are, are dependent on opiates, um, and, and physicians who tend to be dependent on opiates tend to come from the emergency department or the, uh, from anesthesiology. Um, uh, and um, we know that physicians actually quite uncommonly use drugs like meth or cocaine or illegal drugs. Um, in terms of future statistics, it's going to be very interesting to see how many physicians are using marijuana and what sort of screening for marijuana should we be using, um, because that's going to be highly controversial. Uh, some uh, health systems already screen for marijuana uh, at employment, um, but uh, most do not. And so can you tie together then these issues related to substance use and suicide? Sure. I, th- I think um, we know that um, in uh, people who suicide in the general population, a large number of them uh, you know, have taken substances of some description. I think it's at least 50 or 60 percent have taken substances prior to the suicide. There's no reason to suspect that physicians are any different from that, although I actually haven't seen any studies of the amount of substances ingested by physicians who have suicided. I think something that I've become more aware of in the sui- field of suicide is that not everyone who suicides actually has a pre-existing mental illness, that there are really issues around impulsivity, emotional regulation, where there's just this catastrophic moment, a rupture of belonging or a sense of place that leads to the act of suicide that may not have been contemplated much in advance. I think that's very true. And I think the area where that's probably significant within physicians is uh, in, in the area of uh, of how we we call people disruptive physicians, which essentially are primarily physicians who've got personality disorders um, and who are very difficult people who are well known to their colleagues for being difficult people on committees, uh, often uh, fairly narcissistic, um, uh, and who have a very fragile inner world frequently. Um, and and certainly, you know, tend to be risk takers. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's a, they're a group that, that uh, you know, may not in fact meet, you know, formal criteria for depression, um, but who are at potential danger. You talked about denial and self-gratification or delayed gratification. Is there any other kind of humanistic 
So I think one of the one of the big problems in the whole area of physician health is it tends to be an assumption that physicians can somehow resilience themselves out of the problems. Um, and that if physicians only you know, have a better work-life balance and look after each other better, that somehow they'll be able to cope better. Um, and that is just simply not true. Um, the, the literature shows very clearly that uh, you know, the major factor causing the large amounts of burnout that are around at the present time, and, and you know, the studies vary, but somewhere between 40 and 50% of physicians at some stage during their lives have substantial symptoms of burnout. Um, the, the, the studies show very clearly um, that most of the cause of that can be attributed to organizational issues. In other words, to how the health system works, uh, to pressures that are external to the physician. Uh, you know, the biggest uh, pressure in the last decade has clearly been the electronic medical record. Um, and, and that, whilst I'm you know, essentially very keen on technology and, and strongly supportive of it, uh, the reality is uh, you know, many physicians have had to deal with horrible EMRs and uh, spend a lot of time uh, with their work and their home lives quite disrupted by the need to try and keep up uh, with their notes. And that's a big pressure on people. So, so um, a very clear message I want to get out is that physicians shouldn't be blamed for this. Um, and, and shouldn't feel that they're the problem. I mean, I think they're a symptom of a much broader problem. And then, you know, stating the flip side to it, there are many things that institutions can do to try and create a context in which their physicians will be healthier, not languish, where they'll flourish, not suffer. That's exactly right. And there's been several very good studies on that. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement has put out an excellent white paper, for instance, um, as has the Mayo Clinic. Um, looking at how can institutions, in fact, uh, improve and what are the organizational changes that you need to start making to try and make um, life better for uh, clinicians of all, all times, not just physicians. Um, and, and I think these, these approaches, as you correctly say, are focused on the system. And, and so one of the things that any new uh, physician or new psychiatrist needs to think about is, is systems theories and how do they fit into the system and how can the system affect them and how can they affect the system? Um, you know, institutions may struggle with really coming up with radically new ways of supporting their physicians. Um, it isn't just for the well-being of physicians themselves that institutions should take this on. It's also, there's this beautiful literature on how healthy physicians support, say, preventive health practices in their patients, that um, physicians who report feeling good and feeling healthy actually have lower lengths of stay for their acutely ill patients. How does that make sense? But we're finding that healthy physicians leads to healthier patients. I think there's absolutely no doubt about that. There's a very strong correlation between, between both of those things. And, and, uh, and certainly all of the studies say exactly what you're saying, which is that if you, if you can keep your physicians and, uh, and all other clinicians in your system essentially you know, happy, uh, enjoy, enjoying their work, more positive about their work, often more in control of what's going around them, more involved in decision making, uh, listened to, uh, so that uh, you know, they really feel validated in what they're doing. Uh, there's no doubt if that happens that patient care will be improved. Beautiful. Good. Again, anything else you want to cap it off with? Very nice. Um, thank you. Um, the, um, the, the area we haven't covered much is burnout. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so burnout has been described for many years now. Um, and we know that it is a continuing long-term problem uh, within the healthcare system. What we don't know really is, um, does having burnout necessarily lead to depression or anxiety or substance abuse? Um, it's probably a stressor, um, but then so many other things. Uh, and I think probably burnout is best seen in most physicians as actually being uh, really a, a, a primarily a cause uh, from the system. Uh, it, it's really a symptom of a, a health system that's not working as well as it should be. Um, and, and I think if, it's, if burnout is seen as being symptomatic of health systems rather than symptomatic of physicians being unwell, 
then I think that's a nice sort of way of thinking about how can you then move forward and actually start effectively reducing uh, burnout uh, you know, within the workforce. Yeah, I love what you're saying. I mean, there's been kind of this confounding of burnout with whether it's just depression in the physician rather than seeing it as symptomatic of a larger issue. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think actually the literature on the prevalence of depression and anxiety in, say, residents and medical students is actually contributing to this confluence and maybe um, confounding of these different kinds of ideas, one being burnout, institutional contributors to burnout, and then the issues that young physicians and physicians across their life are dealing with that are you know, mental health issues that many people encounter. Yeah, yeah. Now, one other thing that you may find a set of thoughts that may be interesting that I've talked about a little bit in the book was this issue with admission committees. Um, and in some respects, um, when we actually try and select um, pre-med students to come to medical school, we look for people who uh, often have traumatic backgrounds, um, who have what we would now think of as being high ACE scores, first child event scores, um, who have been through the mill and yet who've survived and managed to uh, academically thrive and, and get to medical school, um, and who at the same time are sort of maybe caring um, and a bit compulsive. And so these are often the people we admit to medical school. Now, if you think about it, these are actually people who are specifically vulnerable towards developing later psychiatric disorders or potentially addictions. And so I think we really have to think very carefully about the background of our physicians when we're talking about medical school admissions and who we are actually choosing as physicians, because we're not necessarily choosing the most healthy group. So you would, so say more about this. What evidence would you... Um, instead of the, the distance traveled, uh, overcoming adversity uh, profile of a young student uh, or candidate for medicine, um, how would you look at evidence of resilience, well-being, health? I think that's something we don't really know. I, and I'm speaking of somebody who's read hundreds and hundreds of the, you know, the two pages that the uh, medical students have to put together to convince the admission committee that they need to come into medical school. And they frequently start off with talking about the traumas of their past life or how their family has been affected by a number of medical illnesses and how they have managed to sort of survive that. And it's, it's been interesting and they've then gone and done great things. Now, I'm, of course, not in any way suggesting we shouldn't be admitting people who've, who've overcome adversity. Um, but, I, but I do wonder whether, in fact, uh, we're possibly self-selecting uh, in some cases, people who might have uh, more risk associated with them. And what that means, of course, is that we need to be very open about that at medical school and talk to them about this issue. Um, and if there are some uh, young people who are more at risk, we need to try and you know, prevent them having difficulties later on in life. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the experience of being a trainee, maybe losing a patient, witnessing you know, terrible tragedies, accidents, and you know, this idea of re -tra traumatizing and re-traumatizing young physicians as they go through their training. And that's exactly right. In fact, one of the chapters is focused on the second victim. Um, which is a really interesting concept that has actually been mainly developed from the nursing literature um, and looks at um, the trauma associated with, you know, being close to someone who's died or being, being essentially the, the person away from the immediate treating person or the person on the unit where there's been a whole series of deaths or traumas that have occurred. And I think that second victim syndrome is, is very true. Um, and uh, a number of uh, health systems are now looking at that in more detail and trying to essentially provide some extra uh, counseling and support and uh, interventions for, um, for a much wider range of staff than just maybe the individual physician who's lost a patient. upcoming podcast, we will feature Alan Schatzberg. He will be talking about his textbook, The Textbook of Psychopharmacology, 5th Edition. So, Peter, what advice would you have for treating physicians who are 
often notoriously difficult patients, but also they're our colleagues. They're our they're VIPs in our systems. That's exactly right. And I think I think it first of all, you know, you need to really think about your patients when they're VIPs. Um, and you know, especially if they're physician VIPs. There's been a number of actually in quite interesting papers looking at what does the I stand for. Uh, we, you know, the traditional term is important, but in fact, it could be either influential or intimidating, um, just as effectively. And uh, and so, in my approach certainly is to uh, be very clear with uh, those uh, those people, and especially about physicians, and to assume that they have no knowledge of psychiatry. I think that's the only safe thing to do. Um, you know, a lot of physicians assume that they have you know too much knowledge. Um, or somehow are you know special because they've been through a six-week course you know uh, many years ago when they were at medical school and they and, and they must know all about it. The reality is most physicians are actually surprisingly ignorant about psychiatry, um, and uh, and so I treat them as intelligent, um, rational human beings who uh, could be just as equally a business person, um, and I think. Actually, that's the best approach, because if you do that, then you don't get caught up with them trying to give you the diagnosis all the time, with them trying to manage their own treatment, with them trying to be the special patient. Um, and you treat them you know, as you would you know, other intelligent uh, and hopefully insightful patients, but you don't cut corners. Uh, and I think, I think there's a real need for us to actually start looking at how do we uh, essentially treat uh, other physicians, or other VIPs. There are really no courses as to how to do that that I know of, um, and, and no sets of guidelines for how to do that. So one of the things I've tried to do in this book is lay out a few possible guidelines as to how, as a physician, you can treat VIPs effectively. So give some examples of some of these best practices that you would recommend to your colleagues. Well, I mean, the first, the first best practice is actually, if, you know, if you've made a diagnosis, um, uh, is to actually talk it through with the patient. Don't assume that they know what you mean when you say that they've got a panic disorder. Um, uh, and um, to treat them in the same way as you would anybody else. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll you know, give them the educational materials. I'll tell them to go away and read about it um, and come back and have a discussion and, and be really clear about what is the problem that you're attempting to help them with and, and treat them for. Um, uh, rather than assume that somehow they know what you're talking about, uh, because they're all proud and they're not going to say that they don't. Um, so, um, so assume that they're proud and assume that they're more ignorant um, about psychiatry, but that they're still highly intelligent people. Uh, I mean, my experience overall treating physicians is, is that they really appreciate you being extremely straightforward. Um, so I've told several physicians to their faces that they have a narcissistic personality disorder um, and uh, without any uh, messing around and they usually get a bit offended but then work it out and, and agree. Um, uh, and so once, if they're told directly and they're told honestly, um, then you know, my, my belief is that, that the great majority of physicians actually really appreciate that. Um, and they also appreciate you making it clear that you know you're you have a plan for them because they they're coming here to see you because they haven't got a plan um and they've often thought about seeing you or seeing other people quite a lot beforehand and so um at, at one level they're really looking for someone to help them get back in control of their lives because uh, you know they're generally out of control by the time people like you and i might see them Good. How about um, just really basic issues? Like, do you call your patient by their first name? Do they call you by your first name? How do you deal with the fact that your peers at the same time as being the treating clinician? Yeah, I think that's, that's very interesting. You know, I tend to be fairly formal. Um, and certainly when I'm seeing people initially, um, and I'm respectful of them as, you know, Dr. Smith, just as I hope they're going to be respectful of me. Um, and I think that's the best approach. Um, so, uh, and I tend to do that with all of my patients. Um, uh, so really for me, I don't treat physicians in a way that is particularly different. Um, I, you know, inevitably there are some patients who you end up on first names basis with, who you've seen reasonably regularly. And that sort of happens as a part of a process, I think, over time. 
Um, but uh, no, I think I think keeping things reasonably formal is is definitely a better approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just between you and me, that's I'm very formal. Yeah. I, I actually don't call any patients by their first right. name. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got a couple that I do, um, but they're people I've seen for yeah. you know two or three years. <laughs> yeah, that's after a long time. Yeah. Okay, so let's think again. Um, you know, it's one thing if a physician comes to you and and is really seeking some help with their life issues and worries that they're out of control. But how about if you, as a physician, observe a colleague where you're quite concerned about them and, and believe that they really do require mental health support. Um, do you have thoughts on how best to approach that situation? Sure. Um, and I've had to do that a couple of times in my career with um, fellow psychiatrists. Um, and in both, on both occasions, they're people I've known moderately well. Um, and I've actually just asked them out for coffee. Um, and I've gone to the local coffee shop with them. And then I've raised the topic in an environment that is completely open but confidential, you know, with the corner, the corner table in the coffee shop. Um, and, um, you know, where they hopefully can't get too upset with me, and they can clearly walk out if they want to. Um, but that is more sort of, uh, you know, socially acceptable in some respects, a bit less threatening. Um, and so on both occasions, I've done that with, uh, with, with colleagues and um, it's actually worked out well on both occasions. And they've, they've appreciated me getting away from work so that nobody could see us talking about anything that might be difficult. Um, and, um, you know, that I've uh, on both occasions just said, hey, just this is my impression. I can't force anything on you, but I'm just telling you that I'm giving you some feedback and doing that as a friend and a colleague. Um, um, you know, I'm not trying to be um, too pushy about this, but, uh, you know, are you aware that if I'm noticing this and probably other people are as well? <laughs> and how, how would you like to deal with that? Um, so that would be my normal approach to someone in that sort of setting, if, if possible. Um, I see quite a few physicians who don't necessarily want to come and see me um, and who've been sent to me. Um, uh, as I chair the Wellbeing Committee here at UC Davis, so I see a number of people who are um, referred to the Wellbeing Committee. Um, and uh, first of all, I always see them with someone else, not by myself, um, so that you know we have some sort of sense of, of protection and the two of us there together to you know to make sure that our stories are are, are understood. Um, and um, then. Uh, I'm very clear with, with uh, physicians that they don't have to see me in that setting. Um, but it's up to them, it's their choice. But on the whole, from the wellbeing committee perspective, you know, we're the good guys. We're the guys who can actually help them. We're the guys who are there to try and see if there's a problem that can be treated and, and uh, that we can assist them with uh, you know, either treatment or monitoring or whatever is necessary uh, in that environment and potentially you know, ensure that uh, you know, the health system isn't going to punish them to the same extent or they're not going to get reported to the medical board. Um, and so it's really up to them. If they want to talk to us, they can. If they don't, then I just, you know, that's what I'll report back and just say that, that the individual didn't want to discuss things with us. And so far, touch wood, we've really only had about one person in the last nine years who hasn't then talked to us as a committee uh, in that sort of setting. Yeah, beautiful. Um, good, I can't, let's see, I'm trying to find the I've burnout, burnout definition. Sorry. Um, I'm, okay, I'm yeah, good. stupid by your question. <laughs> no, 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 but I think it's because, yeah. I, I mean, I have, a, I have a barrier to it because I so dislike the construct, but anyway, so. Well, um, well, ask me about that. I'll tell you my view on that if you want, that's fine. Okay, I can good, agree with yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So th the term burnout is somehow uncomfortable for me. Um, and yet it is really a, a, a concept that has gained some traction in the empirical literature on physician well-being. And so can you just explain a little bit about what the idea of physician burnout is? And then if you could also comment on how you think it may or may not relate to mental sure. illness. So first of all, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's a very difficult term. I hope it's never, I hope it never becomes a formal diagnosis. Um, and I think um, the symptoms that are reflected in burnout wax and wane quite dramatically over time and don't have the consistency of symptoms you'd expect to have a diagnosis. So it, I think of it as being a syndrome. And it's a syndrome that has changed over the years, but, but nowadays has basically 
uh, consists of three components. I mean, the first is essentially just tiredness, physical and emotional exhaustion. Um, the second is, is a feeling of cynicism and detachment from your patients and from your work. And the third is, is, is just feelings of ineffectiveness or a lack of accomplishment at work. Um, so basically you feel tired, you're not interested in your patients and you don't feel you're doing a good job. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line with burnout. And that's, for, that's for all three levels. Now, the, um, the, the literature suggests that probably about 15 to 20% of people at any, one, at any one time during their careers have all three levels. Okay, the problem I have with the literature is that um, it really is looking at only one of the three levels or one of the three constellations of symptoms. And so a lot of these big studies that have been done uh, in recent years where, you know, levels of 55% of symptoms of burnout have, have been reported have really only reported one out of those three constellations of, of symptoms. And it's, it's sort of like saying, hey, we've got an awful lot of people who are slightly depressed sometimes. Um, so I'm fairly careful about um, you know, how you actually sort of assess burnout. And I think that the numbers that are thrown around about at the moment you know, are very easy to misinterpret. Mm -hmm. And so is there an observation about burnout and the presence of mental illness and burnout and suicide? Yeah, so, so I think, I think the assumption that most people make, and I would make the same assumption, is that burnout is a symptom of something. Um, I, as I say, I, I, my personal view is it's primarily a symptom of a system in distress rather than an, rather than an individual, okay? But, it, but, but working in that system is still a stressor for the individual. And so I would see it as being one of a number of stressors that might lead to depression, for instance, as along with a family history of psychiatric illness, along with maybe drinking too much, along with not being as healthy as you should be. Um, so, you know, along with difficulties with your marriage. I mean, all sorts of other things as well. So I just see it as being one of those symptoms. Um, and uh, in some people, and there's a scenario in the book where this occurs, you know, it, it sort of uh, burnout then you know, gradually changes into depression. And I think that certainly does happen. But uh, as, as in the scenario in the book, there are multiple other stress wars as well, not just the burnout that's work-related. Thank you, perfect, unbelievable. Okay. So are there other thoughts on this particular book? Suicide, its um, prevalence, getting the stories out there. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, actually one other very important thing, okay? Um, yeah. So uh, about the effectiveness of physician health programs, okay? Um, so, so, so I'll just talk about that. So, so you know, one of the things that is, uh, is hidden, quite honestly, from most physicians is that if physicians have a, an addiction to whatever substance, um, there are actually highly effective treatment programs available through the physician health programs that most states have or uh, in, the state of, in, in California, for instance, that many hospitals have. Um, and these physician health programs that typically involve um, people being assessed, monitored, and treated um, have incredibly good um, recovery rates, with uh, rates at, at five years of about 75% of physicians in them actually both working and being licensed as, uh, as physicians. Now, that's way, way better for someone with a substance abuse than any other treatment program I've ever heard of in any non-physician group. Um, and and the, so the physician health programs work through a combination of carrots and sticks. Um, you know, the carrots are that you keep to practice, uh, that the medical board doesn't uh, frequently get told about your problem, uh, that you get appropriate treatment. The sticks are that, you know, the risk is that the medical board will be told or you'll lose your job. Um, and at the same time, you are put through uh, a mandated um, body fluid monitoring process whereby, you know, you probably have your urine tested, depending on the drug and the situation, most weeks. Um, so, the, but these programs are highly effective. So one of the, the myths about physician health is that the physician addict cannot be helped. And, um, and I would strongly su suggest that that's not true. And that any physicians who are addicts who might be listening to this or any people who are wanting to 
uh, assist colleagues who they think are addicted in some way should confront them and should get them into treatment through a physician health program because the outcomes of these programs are really amazingly good compared with not getting treated. Beautiful. Oh, that's great. So no, it's true. It's, it's astonishing. I, I did a, a, wrote a paper on psychiatrists being followed up and it was 80% working and licensed at five years, all of whom had had substance problems that had led to them going into the program initially. I mean, it's amazing. Good. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Beautiful book. We hope you're enjoying this program, the APA Publishing's books podcast, Psychiatry Unbound. I'm speaking today with Dr. Grace Jean Gu, who is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine. Grace is a licensed clinical psychologist and a board certified behavior analyst who has particular expertise in the clinical evaluation and behavioral treatment of children with autism spectrum disorders. But Grace also has an extraordinary interest in the well-being of mental health professionals and thought would be just a wonderful person to talk to about Dr. Yellow Lease's new book, which is on a hard topic um, about physician suicide and cases and commentaries. So Grace, let me just thank you so much for, for visiting with us today. My pleasure. I want to welcome yeah, I want to welcome you to the APA Books Thank Podcast. You. So um, you read Dr. Yellow Lee's yes. book. Hard, hard book, huh? Hard, beautiful, hard book. Yeah, I have to say, I, um, you know, the topic of physician suicide is a difficult one to, to talk about and difficult one to read about. One of the things I appreciated uh, really the most about the book was the, the writing style really was very captivating and the way that uh, Dr. Yellowies decided to bring in the case studies, um, the fictional case studies, as a way of presenting these really difficult topics um, in a human and um, very um, empathic way. I, I actually loved reading the book. It was quite a page turner. And... Um, mm -hmm. Got, I learned a lot, and I really am going to start recommending it to many of the people that I know, uh, both people who deal directly with physician suicide, but also I think it's a great text for any of us uh, working in the healthcare professions to help us understand more about um, how we can help our colleagues and uh, for students to learn about prevention strategies. He talks a lot about about system and individual prevention strategies, which I love. Yeah, I thought that I learned a great deal about self-compassion in this book. And I also learned kind of not to blame the victim. Uh, you know, I mean, we all theoretically would never blame the victim, right? But, but as he told the stories, looking at the system's components, what set things up that led to these tragedies, I, I thought was really very, very well illustrated. So. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about a couple of the techniques he used uh, in the writing. What made it so captivating? Right. Why was it a book that you wanted to read despite such a hard, such a hard topic? Yeah, he um, in the introduction he talked about um, drawing inspiration from Oliver Sacks and his tradition of telling stories about. Um, patients through um, through a narrative approach, and I um, so the way the book is organized is that uh, each of the chapters deals with a central theme related to physician um, suicide or illness or wellness, uh, but starts with a, with a story that's a fictional depiction of probably a, um, a drawn from his clinical experience and from the literature. Um, but designed to illustrate the specific challenges around physician wellness. And the, um, I think what's, what's so um, well-crafted about the stories is that they, um, they read like fiction. It's, um, it's exciting to find out what happened next, but um, they also are um, 
illustrating the way that the systems, some of the maybe exemplary systems that have been developed to handle physician wellness problems have, um, can intervene and can be helpful in uh, challenging situations where physicians are, are at risk of suicide. So ironically, there's kind of a hopeful message in much of, in much of the book, even though it's really focused on physician suicide. Absolutely. I um, think that's a real strength of the book that it illustrates different um, techniques that can be used in the um, in, in a healthcare system, but also by, by individual practitioners to prevent um, suicide. I think there's quite a bit more that can be said about the topic of, um, of physician wellness. Uh, maybe, maybe there'll be a second book <laughs> that, um, that talks also about um, wellness, even for those not at risk of suicide, but um, to enhance the meaningful contributions that professionals can make to their patient health um, through enhancing their own wellness. But I, I love that yeah. um, that uh, optimistic or, um, you know, solution-focused approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, one of the great developments in the field is not just to look at burnout and these negative impairment, very negative aspects of the lives of professionals, but to turn it around and look at how the positive self-care practices, self-compassion, well-being certainly helps um, maintain the workforce, keeps people working and caring for others, but also translates into improved patient care practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, there, I remember parts of the book that talked a lot about the importance in, in healthcare systems of um, better care for patients, better outcomes for patients, and of course, lower costs. But uh, Dr. Yellowlees does a nice job of pointing out that the activities that support clinician wellness make it easier for um, patients to improve faster as well. So um, could you just talk a little bit about how you came to have an interest in this area? Sure. Um, probably like many of us, I have a, a professional interest as well as a personal interest. So you mentioned in the introduction that uh, my main area of academic focus is in the area of autism treatment. And um, in autism treatment, we have found over the years that strengths-based approaches to treatment really have the strongest uh, effect. And um, one of the reasons for this is that children with autism have such difficulty interacting with others that they develop a feeling of learned helplessness, where they're, they um, learn that their, their behavior doesn't really matter in their environment. And one of the things that's very therapeutic about the behavioral treatments we do is that it helps children feel more um, confident and successful and makes them want to try more. And as I've worked more and more with children and families of children with autism, I've learned that this is actually true for all of us. We've started to add more, um, uh, more work on helping parents of children with autism feel optimistic, um, build the skills for resilience in their difficult lives. And uh, it turns out that stress isn't, doesn't inevitably lead to, um, to impairment but that you can teach resilience and there are, um, there are types of treatments that really do improve resilience. And um, as I've been working in this area, I've realized that uh, my colleagues also sometimes suffer from learned helplessness, um, uh, myself as well. Um, and so I've started to become really interested in what we can do as uh, psychologists, as psychiatrists, to apply what we know um, helps the mental health of the individuals we work with um, to, uh, to help us be more professionally effective, but also more, more personally fulfilled. Um, and then I have to say, as, a, as um, I have two young children, and as a mom, I uh, realized that uh, I had to learn this the hard way myself. I, um, when I was pregnant with my uh, second child, I developed a condition where I really couldn't walk without a lot of pain and realized that I had, as an ambitious 
professional and a care, you know, a mother, a very dedicated mother, I had really neglected my own care um, and hadn't been taking care of myself well enough. And so I started to read a lot about, um, about wellness and about um, how to improve my own uh, self-care practices. And it's uh, st started a, a cycle where I met a lot of people who were interested in um, wellness for, for professionals and um, started to try to inspire others <laughs> to, um, to take care of themselves. So how's it going? <laughs> well, I have to say it's, um, you know, the, everything I've learned has um, made me realize that this is not, that I'm not alone, that this is not a, a challenge that um, only a couple of us face, actually. Um, this is one of the things that was so also interesting about the book. Um, Dr. Yellowlees talked about the different developmental stages um, in a professional's career and really highlighted the unique challenges um, for students, for early career professionals, for late career professionals, and even for mid-career professionals, how at every stage of a professional's career, it's um, the topic of wellness has, has really important meaning. So for personally, for me, um, the, the chance to connect with other people around the topic of improved wellness has helped my personal happiness tremendously and my professional effectiveness as well. Um, it, it turns out that the happier and more satisfied we are and the more we're um, working on meaningful contributions in, in a career, um, the, the better we feel and the more effective we can be. So this is a podcast, but um, I'm, able, I'm able to see Dr. Gonju's face, and she's got a big <laughs> smile, and it makes me, makes me smile, too. So I think, I think what you're talking about is very, very inspiring. Um, the other thing that I think you saw, let me put it differently. I, 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 I heard you mention that the solution-focused uh, approach that Dr. Yellow Lease takes um, is something that you value about the book. Could you comment a little bit further on that? Yeah, I think um, there's been quite a lot of uh, awareness, maybe still not quite <laughs> quite enough, but awareness of uh, physician burnout and the negative consequences that can come from that, um, both for the physicians themselves, but of course for their patients as well. Um, but I really think that the, now in the field we're in a we have a unique opportunity to advance the science around individual and organizational supports that can be put in place to enhance wellness. And um, much more work will need to be done in this area, but Dr. Yellowlees really um, starts a very important conversation around how to, how to think about both the individual and the organizational improvements that can be made around wellness. So he highlights a few um, key areas, I think. Uh, one mm -hmm. is the, the issue of choice and control. Um, actually, back to the, the work that we do in treatment of autism, um, we work a lot uh, with the, the variable of choice um, across scientific areas. Um, we've seen that when people have choices, it increases their motivation, it reduces their feelings of helplessness. Um, there's even pretty strong neuroscience um, emerging around mm -hmm. how um, it's not just that people love what they choose, um, or it's not just that people choose the things that they love, but they come to love the things that they choose. Um, and I think in, the, in talking about how to improve physician wellness, one of the systems that can be put in place is greater choice for professionals around, um, around their work. Uh, another area that he highlights is um, the importance of really allowing professionals to make a meaningful contribution that he made a, a, a suggestion, I think, in one of the chapters about um, physicians having 20% of their practice devoted to care in, a, in an area of strong personal meaning to the physician. 
And I think that when, this is another thing that's been shown across, um, across industries really, that when people um, are really connected with the mission that their work relates to, their sense of meaning improves and their well-being improves as well. So um, I like the suggestions around ways to um, connect us all with the meaning in our work. Um, the practice of medicine, the practice of psychiatry and psychology, um, these are fields that have tremendous potential to bring, um, to, to make meaningful contributions and can be some of the most rewarding and inspiring choices for a profession. But they also come with serious risks because caring for sick people is hard work. Um, it's not inevitably going to lead to burnout, but, um, but a lot of uh, supports need to be put in place to make sure that those who are working with the most challenging patient populations um, or with the most challenging illnesses have the support so that they can provide that care with compassion and empathy and uh, with their with their the fullest extent of their expertise that's beautiful <laughs> that really is great what else um i think peter in his preface talks about how 400 physicians uh, end their lives intentionally every year and we really think that's probably an underestimate and with um, issues around addiction and substance use there may be you know, a number of deaths that aren't counted in that, um, in that right. figure. And so it's given that so many different conditions affect so many different thousands and thousands of people. How do we begin to understand that number of 400, 500, whatever it ends up being? How, how would you think about that number of 400 deaths of physicians every year due to suicide? Right. Um, that that's a huge number um, because behind that are thousands and thousands of people who are suffering. Um, the the four hundred is uh, the worst case scenario. That's the the worst outcomes, and um, many many physicians feel the stress of their work and feel isolated and have feel like there's nowhere to turn where they can get private or confidential help. Um, and then there's the effect on their patients, the thousands and thousands of patients that, um, that a physician who is unwell might be in contact with. Um, I, I think that the book really highlights how important it is to have systems to identify physicians at risk um, and f systems for colleagues to help um, guide physicians who are at risk into care and how to provide intervention with enough privacy that um, physicians feel like they can access it. This is a, an area where I think the use, the increasing use of technology in treatment will be a huge benefit. Uh, Dr. Yellowlees points out in the book how um, some apps have been developed for helping um, push through mental health interventions, of course, to patient populations across the world, but, but there are specific technologies that can help physicians, but also how being able to see a healthcare provider um, via the web or um, receive psychiatric care um, over over the internet can can really help. Uh, on the one hand, decrease some of the burden of providing the care to patients, but also can increase the privacy when physicians themselves need to seek um, care within their within their own systems. You know, there have been empirical studies of medical students, residents, practicing physicians, an astonishing study of surgeons just a few years ago, where fear of 
professional repercussions really prevented them from seeking mental health care, even when they felt suicidal or, you know, had a, were preoccupied with thoughts of suicide, even over a sustained period. Yeah, and I found it surprising, um, Dr. Yellowley's re references several times in the book, even among physicians in general, uh, the acts there, he says, I think 35% of physicians don't have their own primary care physician. Um, and so the, the access of mental health care is even, um, is even lower than that, uh, which is quite, quite concerning. And I think those issues around privacy are a key way to break down barriers um, to access mental health care. You know, one of the things that Peter talked about in our interview was the idea of kind of delayed gratification and self-sacrifice is going with training in the professions mm -hmm. and how we get into the habit of not taking care of ourselves. Absolutely. Um, but I think that, um, you know, the, so on the other hand, there, there are, um, there are aspects of, of being a physician or being a mental health care provider that do place you at great risk of um, compromised well-being. Um, but on the other hand, I think that there are aspects that, of uh, mental health care professionals that really um, mean that they have great potential for, uh, for well-being. These are usually people who care about taking care of others, care about, um, believe the science <laughs> that, um, that self-care matters, and um, you know, are very um, driven and energetic and um, have been successful in many of their other endeavors. So I, it feels to me like there's no excuse not to apply what we know about mental health to ourselves. My own, my own experience has been that it, I've had such a meaningful career in psychiatry that I find it is so inspiring. And so this one dimension of meaning and purposefulness and feeling like you're aligned with that role in life really speaks mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I also find that the more that I'm working on the things that I care the very most about, um, the more that, um, that I feel like, like I have the energy to, to support other people's well-being as well. Mm -hmm. You and I wrote, well, mostly you, wrote this beautiful, beautiful um, editorial uh, on the topic of well-being. And one of the key features of that, um, of that narrative were the lessons that we could learn from psychology as we think about uh, well-being in medicine uh, in, in particular. So perhaps there's some guidance you could offer from the field of psychology? Right. I, um, well, one of the things that I think a movement that's been happening in the field of psychology for a long time, um, but is continuing to gain steam, is the, the focus on of positive psychology, the focus um, on, on strengths-based approaches to treatment, the focus on optimism and resilience, um, much of the, the focus of even cognitive behavioral therapy is on how to teach people to be um, both realistic, but also um, to break down any um, unnecessary or, or unhelpful pessimism that, um, that emerges um, from stressful life experiences. Um, the other area in psychology that I think contributes quite a bit to this discussion is the focus of organizational psychology. Um, there's a lot that um, both on a very practical level, um, a lot about the workplace that can be adjusted mm -hmm. to s promote health. So um, we know that um, flexible work hours are, uh, you know, promote, promote health and um, access to affordable childcare and household help and um, even things like um, there was a study I was reading about how um, the the number of patients that a doctor sees doesn't seem to um, really negatively affect their well-being but the things um, the paperwork and the other 
um, burdens of the of the job are the things that really seem to contribute the most to burnout. So um, there's been like, for instance, Dr. Yalilis mentions in his um, in one of his chapters the use of uh, medical scribes to help um, reduce the burden around the electronic medical record documentation that physicians have to complete. And I think there's a lot of, from organizational psychology, there's a lot of simple, practical um, innovations that can, um, can be put into workplaces to make um, the just day-to-day -day functioning of, of a worker more efficient. And then um, at a higher level, the, that field also has quite a lot to say about um, how to make mean, how to make people's work lives feel more meaningful. So the um, ways to increase personal connections at work, personal connections have been shown to really influence well-being maybe more than almost anything else. And um, how to help people, um, help professionals um, be more effective in, in their leadership uh, style. Um, so I, I had um, have had a chance to talk with um, some of the folks in the business school and other departments in our university, and um, there's actually a wealth of information about how to cultivate leaders and um, how to coach individuals to be more effective professionally. I think access to those kinds of resources is also um, a, could be a tremendous benefit to, um, to, to physicians as they are developing in their careers. Thank you for sharing this day with us. You're listening to Psychiatry Unbound, APA Publishing's book podcast. Our host is Dr. Laura Roberts. She is the Catherine Dexter McCormick and Stanley McCormick Memorial Professor and Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Stanford University School of Medicine. She is also Editor-in-Chief of the Books Program at American Psychiatric Association Publishing. Dr. Peter Yolis is Professor of Psychiatry and Vice Chair for Faculty Development in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, Davis School of Medicine in Sacramento, California, and president of the American Telemedicine Association, headquartered in Washington, D.C. Dr. Grace Changeau is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Our original music is by Willow Roberts, our coordinating producer, Kyle Lane McKinley, our executive producer, Tim Marney. This podcast is made possible by the generous support of Stanford University. We are a production of American Psychiatric Association Publishing, John McDuffie Publisher. To purchase copies of this book or other books by our guest or host, please visit www.appi.org. That's A-P-P-I dot org. If you'd like to contact us, drop us an email at bookspodcast at psych.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast, and thank you for listening.